In art, the end of belief in a myth shows almost immediately in the profound differences apparent in the handling of what were once sacred subjects. No artist can get out of his culture. As the saying goes, he may abhor it, but he can't ignore it. And therefore, his culture's religious and philosophical assumptions will color his work, whether he wants it to or not, just as it does the work of a writer. This simply means that an Aphrodite by and for Greeks in 330 BC is a very different work of art than an Aphrodite done for an 18th century French nobleman. We are going to approach this larger subject of cultural assumptions through Greek mythology, but it is equally applicable to any myths which find their way into literature and the fine arts. There is always a tremendous difference between painting or sculpting a subject which one believes to be divine and simply focusing on artistic excellence. That is, you can almost always tell the work of a true believer in art as well as in literature. The important things to remember are that the differences in cultural philosophy result in overwhelming differences in the artistic handling of mythical themes. Artists cannot get outside of their cultures, regardless of subject matter. These two points can be easily illustrated. This judgment of Paris is by Peter Paul Rubens. I doubt if anyone would ever confuse it with this work, also called The Judgment of Paris by Cranach. Though only some 50 years separate the paintings, it would seem more like 200 years. The artists are roughly contemporary, but they come from vastly different cultures. Cranach was a German, painting in a Protestant world and strongly tied spiritually to the medieval past. Rubens, on the other hand, was from the southern Netherlands, a country governed in the 17th century by Catholic Spain and separated from its northern neighbors by religion, social structure, and economic interest. The church made the Netherlands into a powerful bastion of the Catholic faith, and in the counter-reformation world of the Baroque period, that meant art became important once again as a means of instruction, this time through the senses or emotions. There was great respect in Rubens' culture for classical antiquity, and Rubens himself was very much in that tradition. Speaking of cultural philosophy, Victorian ladies looking at pictures by Rubens very often fell into a swoon at the sight of his nudes. Cranach's Protestant North was not comfortable with the lush forms, grand gestures, and classical themes that were so much a part of the Catholic artist's preoccupation. There was hope among some German painters for a monumental northern art, but it remained unfulfilled. Their efforts in that direction were doomed because the spiritual leaders of the Reformation looked on artists and art with outright hostility. Graven images and all that. Nothing you can see could be less classical than Cranach's three coquettish ladies, whose wriggly nakedness fits the northern background well enough, but bears no resemblance to the stance of goddesses. They just look cold. 
Here, in another Cranach, the Trojan prince Paris is shown simply portrayed as a German knight clad in fashionable armor, undistinguishable from the nobles at the court of Saxony who were the artist's patrons. For some reason, Cranach has chosen to portray Hermes as a white-bearded old man. These paintings are good examples of a single myth as seen through two distinct sets of cultural, philosophical, and artistic biases. They illustrate that no artist can escape his culture and that no myth can hope for a similar expression in different cultures. The following works will make this point at greater length by using a single mythological subject, the story of the half-divine parentage of Helen of Troy. The handling of this myth in art will be traced from the 5th century BC to our own time. We will see that art which has existed in every known civilization long before written language, is an accurate barometer of a culture's ideas about the subjects it addresses and about itself. The myth of Leda and the Swan is simply this. Leda was the wife of King Tyndareus of Sparta. She bore him two mortal children, Castor and Clytemnestra, and two immortal children, Pollux and Helen. The immortal children were the product of a union with Zeus, who visited her in the guise of a swan. This work is a very early representation of the myth. It predates the classical period and would be contemporary with the Battle of Marathon, about 490 BC. This was a time when the Greeks believed in their pantheon. One has need of such gods when outnumbered six to one by Darius's Persians and when one's Spartan allies show up the day after the battle. Zeus is all-powerful here. The woman is almost incidental, dangling helplessly in the grip of the divine ruler of the gods. He seems an awful god, in the true sense of the word, to fill one with awe. But this sculpture has the strength and beauty which the Greeks always portrayed as a part of man's proper state. This work is over a hundred years later than the previous one, done about 370 BC. A great deal has obviously happened in that 100 years, in the world of art and in the power of myth. Leda is no longer incidental. She even makes a compassionate gesture of protection over the swan, which is seemingly threatened by an eagle. There is a childish innocence and fear mixed with a sudden recognition of the god. Looking at this representation, one sees illustrated Sophocles' statement, there is nothing more glorious than the gloriousness of man. However the gods are thought of, it is man that is glorified here. Taking a huge jump forward in time, 1,800 years to be exact, this is a 16th century work by Amanati, a mannerist sculptor in the school of Michelangelo. The reason for the time lapse is, of course, mostly due to a little disturbance known as the Dark Ages. But even before that, Ancient Rome was generally a derivative culture, artistically speaking, which is to say that they mostly copied things from the Greeks. 
With the Renaissance came the return of the humanism of the ancient Greeks. The 16th century studied the ancient works then being excavated and were deeply impressed. There is no question, of course, of belief in the Greek myths. Their world was a Christian one, but they still believed in the classical ideals of perfect beauty. They also believed in the cult of the individual artist, and they strove to raise the standards of artistic excellence in their society. With Amanati's Lida, the principal aim is to create a work of beauty and solemnity. The coupling of Lida and the swan is believable and yet not lascivious. Its perfection of composition and its serenity make us accept what could be thought of basically as a pretty silly idea. Translating the same theme into paint and canvas, this Rubens painting was done in the 17th century. The different medium allows Rubens to introduce a sensuality into the subject that the Baroque world encouraged. Baroque art played to the senses in a way that the Renaissance never did. The more abundant the flesh, the more sensuous the color, the more evocative of sensual reality, the better. Compositionally speaking, Aminati had the last word on the coupling of Lida and the Swan. Later artists seldom attempted to show the pair in the act, as it were. The swan is very much incidental in this work of the Venetian painter Jacopo Tintoretto. His forte was the exquisite luminous color peculiar to the Venetian school. One suspects Tintoretto could have called the painting anything. The swan has so little effect on the composition. When the Renaissance artist wished to paint the nude, he naturally turned to pagan subjects. They lent the work importance in the eyes of a society busily steeping itself in classical humanism. This work by Antoine Coypel is obviously not a Renaissance work. By the time of this representation, the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the sensual Baroque had considerably lightened the burden on medieval constraint, but obviously this can have negative side effects. Skill, beauty, and sensuality are no longer enough. Here, the artist, confronted with the subject of Lita and the Swan, feels the need to make it smutty. Once again, Lita and Zeus are pictured in the act, but rather differently from Amanati's concept. Here, with the addition of two impossible cupids, and in the hands of an obviously inferior artist, the work becomes arch and ridiculous. But poor Lita still has further to fall. Here is a 20th century version of the myth housed in the University of Utah. It is not awe-inspiring, nor filled with the gloriousness of men, nor solemnly beautiful, nor even merely smutty. It is simply a rather crude drawing of a human female carrying on with what looks like a duck. It is easy to trace a similar historical development in another mythological line. The one member of the Greek pantheon that has found representation in nearly every century is the goddess of love and beauty, Aphrodite. However, as you might by now suspect, she has not survived unchanged. She has been bent and remolded countless times and finally stripped of every spiritual mythological element. From solemn religious cult figure, 
through laughter loving giver of joy to symbolic courtesan she has until very recently always managed to remain ultimately beautiful and desirable this religious figure is not aphrodite but an early female cult figure it dates from around 520 bc something like 100 years after the poetess sappho it is probably out of such cult figures that a fully defined sense of the goddess aphrodite was taken this relief is called the birth of aphrodite and is roughly contemporary with the youth of pericles around 460 BC. In it, we see a representation of the story that Aphrodite was seaborn. This is a truly fine copy of the exquisite classical Aphrodite of Praxiteles. In antiquity, it was regarded as an absolute masterpiece of this artist. Pliny, the historian, wrote that many people suffered the hardships of an ocean voyage just for a view of her. Other writers have praised the statue as well. The goddess is completely nude here for the first time, but the modest attitude and half-closed eyes of the figure suggest a rather maidenly sensibility. The statue achieved such proverbial fame that she is often referred to in the ancient literature as a synonym for absolute perfection. Her rapt gaze was particularly admired. She seems herself to have fallen under the spell of the forces she embodies. But even that human quality is countered by her consciousness of the magic powers that she exerts on the beholder. It elevates her to a new level of dignity. The statue was done in 330 BC, and in this particular case we know who the model was. She was a girl from Thespia named Phryne because of the pale gold cast of her skin. At the Parthenon in early morning or early evening, There is a special rose gold cast that the sun gives to the marble columns and it may be that which was responsible for the admiration of Phryne's coloring. There is an interesting story connected with her that makes a point about the Greek attitude towards physical perfection. She was charged with impiety with quote having profaned the majesty of the Eleusinian mysteries by parodying them and of being consistently occupied with corrupting the most illustrious citizens of the republic by seducing them from the service of the state and quote with the death penalty inevitable upon conviction Phryne got the orator Hyperides to defend her his defense was brilliant he merely led Phryne before the judges and swiftly removed her robe. The judges stared in wonder. This was no mere woman, this was divinity. So perfect a body could not house an imperfect soul. They acquitted her. This statue is supposed to be in the Museum of the Vatican, where the following insane desecration was perpetrated in the 19th century. According to the president of the Institute of Roman Studies, the copper drapery was added to hide the statue from over-inquisitive eyes, whatever that means. This next Aphrodite is an original work done for the people of Cyrene in the 1st century BC. It is a Hellenistic or late Greek work. The word Hellenistic specifically refers to the time after Alexander the Great began his conquests and to the period beyond that which saw the spread of Greek culture through those conquests 
Other cultures accepted Greek ideas and myths in the years following Alexander, but the power of the Greek world was dying and Rome was in the future. Rome too took Greek gods and ideas, but never in quite the same way as the Greeks. Serene, self-contented Aphrodite, a goddess worthy of worship, becomes a coquette in the Hellenistic world. The Venus Calipugos, or Venus of the beautiful buttocks, so-called for obvious reasons, was originally meant to be placed at the edge of a reflecting pool. In that position, she would be intent on observing herself. Rome had no great respect for the idea of perfection in art. The Greeks were theoretical, but the Romans were content to be practical. Art was to decorate, not to inspire. A man with a villa needed statues. Rome had other things on its mind besides artistic inspiration. Once again, we leap over the Dark Ages to 1468. The pagan gods returned to importance in the early 15th century. Love, fertility, and beauty were back in vogue. The Virgin Mary wasn't exactly out, but Venus, or Aphrodite, was definitely in. Plato was being rediscovered, and with him the notion that the supreme good could be had through beauty. Art was produced for individual fame, but also because beauty was a holy thing. This principle was surely at work here in Sandro Botticelli's Birth of Venus. This is a spiritualization of a sensual theme. Venus is shown being blown by the wind to Cyprus. She is greeted by a nymph who carries her drapery. There is more given to the mind than to the eye here. In the Renaissance, nakedness stood for truth. The room blows on the soul of Venus, and the robe held out to her is the robe of reason. It's interesting to note that every line in the painting is curved, no straight angles or lines. This would have suggested femininity to the Renaissance. This painting, called The Sleeping Venus, is done by Giorgione, a contemporary of Botticelli. This Venetian painting is philosophically and historically important because it served notice, as it were, that not only had the female nude returned, but that women weren't evil incarnate anymore. There were setbacks from time to time. St. Augustine and Paul of Tarsus had done their job well. For example, the madness begun by Savonarola in Florence that resulted in Botticelli actually burning some of his own canvases picturing pagan themes. But setbacks were all they were. Giorgione began paintings like the Sleeping Venus, the practice of painting small secular pictures for private owners. In this painting, Venus's peaceful sleep divorces her entirely from the spectator's world. There is no self-consciousness. She has something of the same quality as Praxiteles' Aphrodite. Here, in the Venus of Urbino by Titian, Venus is not pastoral and subdued. She is very much aware. This work was done only about 50 years after Giorgione's Venus. 
But this lady is no goddess caught sleeping on a summer afternoon. She is an expensive and successful courtesan. Her lovely face is empty of all expression, but that of self-confident self-admiration. She is displayed with all the trappings of her art upon a rather suggestive bed. aside her worldly store in chess. She lies contentedly, for as the saying goes, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Once again, with Venetians, color is preeminent. The red on each corner throws a warm suffusion on the painting. The white drapery is cool and the body smoothly glowing. She may no longer be a goddess, but she is still an exquisite embodiment of beauty and desire. A combination of details, the plants silhouetted against a darkening sky. The curled up dog. The rich stillness of the drape behind her. All give the painting a poetic quality. It's often been remarked that the Venetian painters invented the female nude. They certainly made it their principal mode of expression, just as Michelangelo and Rome made the male nude their mode. Titian himself did a series of these reclining Venuses, each a little more sensual than the last. In this Venus and Cupid, he has emphasized the fertility of Venus. Once again, he has used a courtesan for his model. Venice was a resort city in the 16th century and was renowned for the beauty and intelligence of its ladies for hire. There is a greater sense of isolation and serenity here than in the Venus of Urbino. The landscape through the window seems to shimmer in a heat haze, and there is a distinctly overripe feeling to the work. The last work in this series of Titian reclining nudes is Venus and the Organ Player, which is pretty much his final statement on sensuality. The theme is Venus inspiring the artistic muse. The actuality, however, tends to make one a little uncomfortable. If Titian were not a master painter, this painting might border on the over-obvious. The elegant man, the hint of music in the air, it has all the elements of the concept of life as art. The inclusion of the figure of the organ player emphasizes the sensual tone of the painting but also brings on a certain decadence in feeling. Leaving Titian, we move to the 17th century, when Baroque style brought with it a vogue for presenting Venus in the act of adorning herself, staring raptly into a mirror surrounded by handmaidens and the emblems of classical mythology. In this 1626 Toilet of Venus by Jan Lys, the sacred white doves of Venus are present, as are the pearls symbolic of her sea birth. Also, note the classical ruins in the background. Lys is a Flemish artist, and the exuberance of his figures is a part of the philosophy of his Baroque art. Everything swirls and ripples. The Cupid holding the mirror seems about to tip over backwards. The drapery may whip out of the nymph's hands at any moment. And once again, the representation of Venus has changed. There is a playfulness, an extravagance present that was wholly lacking in the Renaissance. Lys has brought his own culture's artistic values with him. In the 18th century, France was the center of Europe. The Sun King, Louis XIV, 
had presided over nearly 80 years of artistic and political flowering that placed France even above Italy in the world of art. By the mid-1700s, his grandson, Louis XV, and his court lived a fairy tale existence at Versailles. The painter, Francois Boucher, chronicled the court's pastimes. He painted the themes of pleasure, and he painted them as the aristocrats themselves saw them. In this Venus with a Dove, done in 1751, Boucher has left out nothing that a goddess of love and beauty should possess. The doves of her cult, flowers, shells, pearls, and three little cupids are all there. However, hardly any essence of divinity is left. Instead, the painting has the atmosphere of salon art. In an enchanting blend of colors, a society woman is shown absorbed in idle amusement. It's a dream world like Titian's, but this time a very trivial one. Look at the expression on the face of the Cupid doing Venus's hair. See the absorption. He's looking in the mirror with all the concentration of a real hairdresser. The world Boucher was so expert at portraying died out with the whizzing of the guillotine. But Napoleon was soon on the scene creating a whole new set of aristocrats. Napoleon's sister, Pauline, married into a very old family of Italian aristocrats named Borghese, and shortly afterwards dressed herself up as Venus and had Antonio Canova sculpt this work, the Borghese Venus. It is said that she had it done because she had discovered that Canova had produced a colossal nude statue of Napoleon. This statue was typical of the portraits of ancient rulers whose nudity indicated their stature as divinities. Luckily, the statue of Napoleon is today stuck away in Apsley House in London. The statue of Pauline, however, is exquisite. Almost nothing of Pauline's facial features are present. The face is strictly from classical Greece. But since Pauline was said to have possessed a body that wouldn't quit, we can assume that the lower portion of the statue is a faithful likeness. It is said that when Hitler stalked through the Borghese gallery and saw this statue, he ordered it covered because it was too lewd. What is of significance here is not the statue itself, which is a perfect work by a very great artist, but the transformation of the goddess Aphrodite. One wonders idly if in a couple of thousand years the premier ladies of the world will be commissioning their portraits dressed up as the Virgin Mary. Finally, there is the 19th century work Olympia by Monet. It is obviously influenced by Titian's Venus of Urbino and is just about the last stop for the golden goddess of love and beauty. Here she is, robbed of the last and only attribute she retained for all the centuries, her beauty. When the work was first shown in 1865, one reviewer said, quote, The flesh tone is dirty, the model nothing. This brunette is thoroughly ugly, her face stupid, and her skin cadaverous, end quote. Our modern critics try to soften the blow by saying, quote, Monet's aversion to the bourgeoisie and their shallow taste led him to pursue the idea of reality, even as far as brutality. The difference lies mostly in our cultural assumptions. Moderns tend to cherish ugliness and brutality and to reject idealization. Grace and style and beauty will have to go elsewhere for appreciation. Like the Romans, all we want are the facts. And of course, there they are. 
One wonders what a classical Greek might think if he could see his laughter-loving goddess now. <laughs> 